Open communication has been that big piece for us, particularly yeah. over the past few years where you're dealing with people who are wanting to remote, you've had periods of working remote and how you build a culture. So really clear, consistent communication across teams about the bigger vision and how that's executing. So little things that we do now, and that's sort of new to me, but something that the tech team brought to us is we do uh, every morning, Monday toast. So, oh, so yeah. Monday morning, uh, all hands in the office at 9am around a coffee in the kitchen. And it's a chance for uh, groups of two within each team each week, somebody's different. And it's a shout out to things that people have done well or successes, update on business metrics and update on what key things that each team are working on and yes. what's on the roadmap. And so... So welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I'm joined by Dean Anderson, who is the founder and CEO of Kernel. And Kernel is a um, financial services technology firm that helps you save and invest. Have I got that right? Perfect. That yep. sounds great. Thanks. Excellent. <laughs> cool. Now, I've just been talking to Dean and, and hearing about his story. And you're not a tech person, but you now run um, a, success, a successful tech company with about 35 people. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to be in that situation? Yeah, so we are uh, are effectively a fintech, but we are a fintech where the founding team has come from sort of the fin side of the equation, which is probably a little bit unusual. Many fintechs tend to be formed by, by a technology-led mindset. And so uh, about three and a half, four years ago, well, actually, sorry, end of 2018, decided actually we felt there was an opportunity to build a better financial provider that was going to align to the typical Kiwis' long-term financial needs that there was a gap where many Kiwis out there don't have a financial partner in their life that's aligned to their interests. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a relationship with the bank anymore. It's very hard to get access to financial advice. So where do you go to help manage your money and build your wealth and give you that financial security you need? And so we wanted to build a really strong brand and platform that enabled people to focus on the habits that actually build long-term wealth. But underpinning that was also the investment tools that people needed to actually achieve those goals. And so we started by becoming a licensed fund manager. We we framed up how we we're going to establish the business, raise capital, establish a small team and applied for a license through the Financial Markets Authority. That license enabled us to launch our own set of funds. We started on that journey. Then obviously subsequently we've also launched our own platform that we enable people to manage their investments in KiwiSaver through and have sort of grown, grown from there over the last three and a half years. And you were saying before, like, it's, it's actually quite difficult because when you're a startup, um, often you can bootstrap things, right? You can go yeah. minimum viable product, go out there, give it a launch, um, put some more money in as and when you need to. But when you're in the financial services sector, that's just not possible, is it? Yeah, correct. And particularly like you know, a tech business today, many tech businesses will start by somebody at home and just let's launch something and we'll see how it goes. We'll iterate on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but with uh, funds management and being a licensed provider of investments in KiwiSaver, to get that license is quite a rigorous process, which which you would expect. You know, we have really significant regulations in New Zealand which protect Kiwis. And to get through that, um, we passed, we were the first to go through the four new regulations that came in place in 2016. And so to establish that business, you effectively have to have a fully formed business on day one. Mm -hmm. We had to have a board, all the governance policies, operating manuals, every sort of detail about how we would operate. But we also had to have third parties involved. So... There are companies like a fund administration, so they're the ones that calculate the unit prices and do all the tax. Uh, you have a supervisor who you legally have to have, which is sort of the eyes and ears for the regulator that all KiwiSaver and all fund managers have. So we had to have these third parties who would be our suppliers also buy into the vision and idea of what we were going to launch and commit to being involved in it. And then we had to have a whole bunch of capital. So you had to have a fully formed business ready to go and launch, um, but there is no way to test your concept. Hmm. So you had to have people really committed to and thinking, right, we've really analysed this, we've looked at the market opportunity, we understand the sector we're playing in, and it's incredibly comp um, competitive. We were up against the big banks and um, back us to launch this thing uh, on day one without ability to kind of do that bootstrapping. So it is quite, tested, a, yeah. <laughs> quite a significant uh upfront investment uh, versus uh, maybe more traditional businesses where you can start a bit smaller and find your way through it over time. And why? What kind of motivated you to start this? I mean, I understand seeing a gap in the market, but yeah. you know, you you had a very good job with the NZX. You've been there for many, many years. Um, to leave that and go out on your own is a, is a big 
big jump, right? Big leap, leap yeah. of faith. So the, the big thing, right? So I spent seven years nearly at NZX, a lot of that time working in indexing and ETFs and investments, and I loved what we did there and, and loved that corporate culture. Um, but in time, I actually, so when I actually left NZX, it wasn't set up. So it was quite interesting. I just felt like I'd done my dash here. I'd, I'd had a number of different roles within the exchange and had an opportunity after selling a house in Wellington to go, you know what, actually, I feel like, yeah, I don't know where I want to go further within this organization. And I just decided, actually, um, I, I'm done now and I'm going to just see what happens next. And it's quite an interesting experience. And, and I actually spoke to somebody on this at the time and I said the best thing that ever happened to them was being made redundant because it forces you to really look at Everything. what do you want to do? Yeah. Where, do you, where do you want to go? What's important to you? So I took some time out, did a bit of contracting, realized actually you know, I'm young. I had no dependents. I didn't have a mortgage. I had some money from a house sale. So if I don't try something now, mm -hmm. um, it's going to get harder and harder to make that call. And for me, it's always been about a passion of building things. I love seeing things grow. I love... The roles I've often been involved in, been at help, helping grow businesses and helping deliver better outcomes for customers. And where I, I felt I was best aligned was a lot of things that happen within financial services are very institutional, mm -hmm. have been done in the interest of the corporate, and the customer really does come at the bottom of the rung. And for me, it was, well, we have the ability here, unlike many others, to start with a clean sheet of paper and go, if you were going to do something today, to build a better outcome for customers where you could use whatever modern technology you liked and you could design a whole business model around the customer, how would you do it? Yep. And felt actually this is where we think this is going, this is how we think the business should look and this is where we think we can make an impact and decided, okay, let's let's rally around that and let's do it. Mm. So I'm really interested because, as you said, you're from a financial background and a tech background, and what, yet what you've built is very much a tech platform. Yep. So how did you get people involved in the business from the technology side, and how did you make sure they were the right people? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the, that is the big challenge. Um, so when we started, the big focus for us initially was on building investment pieces, so building these index funds that um, were more fee and tax efficient for consumers. Uh, and we used a third party platform. So uh, the tech piece initially was an outsourced provider that we white labeled. And that was just because ultimately when we started, there was three of us, you know, three of us, and we were running all the funds ourselves and running the business to do technology at the same time. That's a, it's a big undertaking. And then it was probably um, just under AOA, a bit over 18 months later, we decided actually now was the time where actually we want to take control of our own technology journey. We wanted to build a platform where we could control how people interact with their money, how they set goals, how they view KiwiSaver, and had to make those initial hires. And that was quite an interesting process because, you know, it is a bit like I'm sure somebody from a technology background talking to me about financial services sector it is foreign language. Yes. <laughs> and we're, we're not it talking. It was like a translator, don't you? <laughs> exactly. So yeah. we did need a translator. And we we're very fortunate, though, to have somebody early in our team who had worked in an agency and kind of acted as that translator for us and was able uh -huh. to connect those dots. Uh, and um, the the best thing that we've had was we were very, very fortunate to have a great hire come through the door or a candidate come through the door who came with his to-do list of what he would do in 90 days and some really good insights and had done a lot of homework on us, our existing platform, wow. the flaws of the feature. And um, so instantly it was a, um, a great cultural fit and uh, was very good at articulating that concept across to us on the, on the, the sort of fin side of the equation and could see how we need to talk between parties on weighing up the decision making we make with the platform and the technology investments versus the commercials and how you go through that thought process. So um, through translation and some good candidates, we were able to get the early foundations in place. Mm -hmm. And then that's helped lead the establishment of the team and our upskilling across the business over time. So you've got 35 staff now. I'm interested to know sort of what, what percentage would be technology and development people versus sales, marketing, operations? Yeah, it's probably 50-50 yep. on that. So 50% on the tech now yep. and the rest is on the operation of the funds and the marketing and the customer support and everything else, yeah. And so what's the difference between, you know, when there were three of you working from, were you working in offices? Were you working from yep. your, you were, okay? Yep, yep. so three of you working in office together um, to having 35 staff. What do you think are the biggest differences that you have seen in that, growth period that journey it's interesting because you look back 
you do look back and you went, well, we seem to get everything done with three people. How does it feel like we're scrambling and always short of time or always behind on things when there's 35 people? Yep, yep. Um, it feels like you constantly, you have more staff, but there are more problems, more things you want to do, right? So that doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been going through that process of uh, us now that, that you know, there was probably a year ago that, that, that messy middle part where you start to, step from being a small business where you kind of across every detail yep. and everybody knows what's going on and we're in one room together mm-hmm. to now we've got to the other side of that where we've got teams and uh, you're not across every detail and you're empowering those teams to be able to make decisions and act on their own and that's that big um, that's that big leap and that big change and you you have to just work through that and have good dialogue because there will be growing pains through that and people need to understand how that process and the workflow changes over time because mm-hmm. you go from being a small group where you're one team involved in everything, involved in all decisions, to now having teams who are empowered and making decisions who are interacting with each other and how do you keep that culture alive and how do you keep people focused on our mission. Um, that's a big change. So how do you, how do you keep all fo- focused on, you know, the, the bigger picture? So we, last year I wrote a big vision narrative um, for the business, which I thought was timely when we sort of grow on the team and we're really focusing on where we we're going with the technology side. And so that really was sort of, that underpins, I guess, the big multi-decade vision of where we think the sector and the opportunity is and, and where we play and where we don't play. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the, the big lens that I think people really rally around. That's what we stand for in our values. Then it's trying to break that down because that's that's a long way off and there are multiple pathways to get into that. And then we have a whole bunch of frameworks in place that enable us now to distill these big rocks and break them down into smaller rocks that we can tackle and that the teams can understand and grasp and um, execute on incrementally over time that keep us moving towards that longer vision because um, you do need that structure. You do need to be able to put in place measurable targets and how we're yep. going to achieve on things. And so... We've, we've tried a few different methods recently. We've just gone to sort of this big room planning approach where, you know, a group of people sit in and we, that prioritizes what we're building for the month and uh, everybody has a voice and input into what we need to prioritize and what, what challenges and opportunities there are for us. And then we weigh each of those up and w- how they fit into that, that longer-term opportunity. Hmm. So where do you see the industry kind of headed? Without giving away any kind of secrets, but what no, do you, where look- do you see it going? <laughs> The big thing for us that what we are experiencing a lot of is the biggest market and the biggest problem is the typical average Kiwi. Because if you think about the uh, the financial services sector at the moment, if mm-hmm. you're an average Kiwi out there, you know, I remember my parents, um, you know, you used to have a strong relationship with the bank. Yeah. You had a bank manager, they're always you know, the same person. You used to have a lot of support. About everything, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and I experience on the business side, I think anybody who's listening here who's got a business will know how hard it is to deal with a bank these days. Mm, try and you find know. somebody to talk to. So yeah. A, we've been banking in business banking with one of the big banks since day dot. Mm-hmm. And we've had millions of dollars of transactions, term deposits, all sorts of activity. I've never had a call from anybody. Really? Wow. So, A, we seem to be anonymous in the system. <laughs> <laughs> Which the, can be good and bad, I suspect. But and yeah. then the challenges of, you know, I wanted another card for our team, you know, when they're out expenses card type thing. Yep. And it, we need to produce financial statements and projections and all sorts of things to get a, a, a card. And I was like, well, can we just get a debit card? No, you've already got one. You can't have another. So you can have a credit card. And so you have to have all the stuff. So like, well, we don't actually need the credit. Can we just have a card? And it's like... <laughs> And it's incredibly painful, right? So (laughs) I think many people experience the challenges of dealing with a bank. Mm -hmm. But the average Kiwi out there has no real relationship with their bank anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, It's increasingly through compliance and regulatory changes, it's harder and harder to get access to financial advice. So if you wanted to speak to an investment advisor today, increasingly very common that you need to have a million dollars. Yep. You know, that's just the thresholds where they just don't have the time or resources to deal with anything smaller. So Australia... Uh, over the past few, three or four years has lost 100,000 financial advisors and the percent of the population that now has access to advice is less than 10%. So if you can't get access to When you say lost, lost to, to they've, what? They've left the sector. Right. The regulatory changes became too much for them. Uh, yep, okay. Trying to manage their own business mm-hmm. and trying to be an advisor meant that actually they decided, look, time to retire. Well, they weren't doing what they were loving, right? Correct. So they're, they're, back, yeah, they're actually You're not dealing to run. with the customers. Yep. You're not doing the things you love. You're just dealing with regulation and reporting. 
Mm-hmm. So no relationship with the bank, no access to advice. The other big one I think is changing is a lot less interest for, you know, somebody who's 30, 40 today in investment property. Mm-hmm. You know, A, you need a lot of money up front, yep. but it is draining. I've, I've been there, I've had investment <laughs> properties, and I was speaking yeah. to a friend over the weekend who sold theirs and say, it's actually really nice not having a property. Yep, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> managing tenants and all the other things, it is, you know, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. So... All of these Kiwis out there who have busy social lives, busy corporate lives, how do you build wealth? Like, how do you build your financial security? Where do you have a partner that actually is intuitive, that you have confidence in, is aligned to your interests? Um, that was where we see that cultural gap. And so how do we help give people the, the tools that they need, the experience um, and that brand alignment and values that they have trust in that they can go, great, this is actually a place where I can over the next few decades, set up my financial goals, achieve those financial goals, and know that I'm going to have that financial security mm. down the line. And so that's kind of where we see ourselves. And I think we're seeing a lot more engagement when it comes to investing over the past few years. Mm. But equally, people have realized recently that good investing isn't about picking stocks. Yeah. It's nothing to do with stock picking or timing the markets. It's actually the habits and things like low-cost index funds are – the bread and butter core tools that anybody could be using to set up and automate their investments. And so, you know, 30, 40% of our customers just have an automated investment plan. Yep. They come online, they create an account and they automate it all. And then they carry on with the rest of their lives mm-hmm. and they have the confidence to do that. A really interesting narrative that we've noticed around the property though, which I think is a really important conversation that more Kiwis need to have because we're not big when it comes to talking about money and finances. Uh, we did some analysis to look at what does the future look like for a 25-year-old today. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to run some scenarios given that we now have KiwiSaver and said, so somebody that's 25 today, how important is buying a property for their financial future and financial security? Mm-hmm. And we ran all the scenarios in terms of somebody contributing KiwiSaver and if they had a regular investment plan. What you found was actually you could have an equal amount of financial security and wealth in retirement from investing as buying a property, i.e. you don't know, you no longer need to feel like property is the only way to achieve financial security, which is what a lot of generations mm. have, have thought and have talked about. Yep. And it was interesting because stuff picked the article up and that content up and they published it and it was apparently one of the most commented on and re- like the, the most amount of complaints they had come into them. Complaints. People okay. calling them Nazis and everything, like incredibly extreme views because, you know, they they clearly there is a strong bias towards property in this mm-hmm. market and it really highlighted that. But it missed the point. The point was that today with these modern investment solutions and platforms and with KiwiSaver, the generations now have choice. Mm-hmm. It's not about one or the other, but you have choice and you have the ability to decide, is a property right for you? Is it right for your goals in life? Um, when do you want to buy it? Because I'm a case in point. I'm much happier renting and yeah. not having the stress of home ownership because I'm wanting to focus on establishing a business. Mm-hmm. And that's important to me. Yep. And that's what I enjoy doing. And I have that flexibility to do that and confidence to do that, knowing that things like KiwiSaver and everything else gives me the financial security that I will need in years to come. And so I think it's a much more promising future for Kiwis out there today where they know that there are tools out there through Kiwi Saving Investing that give them that flexibility and you shouldn't feel pressured into buying a house or yeah. that FOMO effect. Yeah, It is funny. Um, one of my very good friends, Stanley Henry, who runs the Attention Seeker, yeah. um, he would be, I don't know how old he is, I'm going to say, suggest perhaps late 20s, early 30s, yeah. and he doesn't own a house either and he's absolutely got no desire at all. Yeah. He actually believes he can make more money by building businesses and yeah. creating business wealth yep. um, and then investing it in the right places than actually owning a home. But I'm 53 this year and you know, I was brought up, it was like, well, you have yeah. to buy a house. Yeah. That's your first thing. And then a rental property, if you can afford it. And uh, I think the next generation will talk about lots of rental properties. But, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to see things changing. It's good to see that there is different ways. And you've got choice. It Living is. the life that you want to live as opposed to the life that somebody Correct. wants you to live. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Okay. So when going back a few steps, I mean, um, when you first started the business, you actually started it just before COVID hit, right? Yeah. Um, how was that? <laughs> so we went through, we, I started on the concept end of 2018 and then decided actually, yep, we raised some capital early 2019. And it takes nearly a year to get 
a license yes. to be able to operate. So a year and a lot of money and a yeah. lot of effort, right? <laughs> uh, and the challenging part with that is um, there are times when everything you've built, you're now handed over and it's submitted to the regulator yep. and you sit in silence for several months <laughs> and it's like, well, what do we do? We, yep. It's a waiting game, which was not that enjoyable. Mm. Um, we got the license in August 2019 and we launched the first um, investment funds in uh, September 2019. Mm -hmm. And then obviously... It was six months after that 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 COVID struck, yes. and 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 that was pretty significant, yeah. Mm. Because I think you were saying that you you had to have people believe in an idea and a concept, and everything else, yeah. uh, without any proof of it. So, and if you'd been a little bit later, yeah, because obviously when it comes to investments and money and financial services, mm. trust is the big factor, right? Which yeah. is why people still have so much tied up with the banks. You know, there is this perception of trust, right? Um, we were probably very fortunate, like many business success stories, right? There's always an element of luck in here and, and challenges and opportunities that come along the way as well. And, you know, we were lucky in the sense that we had a few people like advisors and others who knew who we were and believed in our ability to deliver on what we said we would do and started using us early and got involved early. And we had enough customers that we were set up enough to get to the other side of that COVID hill. If yeah. we had unfortunately launched you know a few months later it's not hard to conceive how challenging it would be to say to somebody great COVID's hit there <laughs> is just this unprecedented uncertainty we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow why don't you place your hard-earned money <laughs> with this new company that's been around two months yeah. in a global pandemic mm -hmm. um so we had just got enough scale and enough customers who stuck with us and you know saw the longer term vision and continue to use us through COVID, that actually it gave us the opportunity to double down on what we did. Um, but it did take a lot to make sure our shareholders and everybody saw that big vision and backed yep. us. And, so um, lots of communication by yeah, that time. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so biggest challenge, what do you think has been the absolute biggest challenge from going to, from being, you know, working for somebody to being your own business owner? What do you think is your biggest challenge so far? Uh, the big thing is growing teams, right? Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, that's such a critical factor. You know, your team and their ability, you know, if you don't have a, a team that clearly understands what we're doing and understands the need to execute on these things, you know, we're a startup. Yep. You know, we are a startup and anybody who's involved in business will understand that, you know, we, we have things that we need to deliver on and you're trying to grow a business, but you have constrained resources. Mm -hmm. And so how do you operate within that? And so... You know, there, there was that big period of going from a small team of, you know, half a dozen of us where we knew and influenced everything. You know, mm -hmm. we were able to control everything. We were the owners of our destiny. We, we knew exactly what we were talking about yep. because we were very experienced in it. And we just got on and did stuff. And then now, fast forward, as part of that growth, you have to grow a team. And, and we're now having to empower individual teams rather than one team to be able to make decisions, to understand the bigger problem, to work together, to uh, have the competencies to operate within this sphere and, and also make sure that teams communicate to each other yep. and you keep that culture. And that's that's challenging. Um, I think we did a fairly good job of it. A good example is, particularly on the technology side, if you think about what happened over the past few years, it became incredibly competitive mm -hmm. for technology talent. Yep. And Not there yet. was a war on and... And you salaries. did have exactly <laughs> salaries were just astronomical and yeah. the expectations because banks and others were just paying anything. Mm -hmm. And again, communication was really key there. And so for us, we, we were really open about, look, well, this is where we think it's at. Um, and making sure people understood that we cared deeply about them as staff, just as much as our customers and that we are building a long term business that's sustainable here. And the last thing we wanted to do was hire unsustainably or pay unsustainable salaries mm. that would have meant in 12 to 18 months time, unfortunately, sorry, we now need to cut X staff or cut, cut salaries. And so we were really open during that period and talked through that and said, look, you may be tempted, but just take caution because people had mortgages, they had kids. Yeah. And what we've been fortunate to get to now is they, they started to see the reality of that about 12 months ago, where that space changed quite quickly. Mm. You saw all the layoffs over in the US, and all of a sudden there was, wasn't as much um, 
competitive tension for the developers. You know, it's a global resource, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you started to see locally, even big names like Zero mm. laying off hundreds of staff. And I think that faith in us and how we treated our, our staff has really cemented a strong culture within the team because they understand that actually we care just about as much about them as our customers, that you are part of this family and this business. Yep. And we're not just going to treat you like a number. We're not just going to hire people for the sake of hiring. We're not just going to pay anything because it's got to be sustainable and that's going to be beneficial to everybody over the long term because I think a lot of people have been hurt where companies have um, grown too quickly and made unsustainable promises and have subsequently meant that they've had to pull back on their workforce and made a bunch of people redundant, which isn't a pleasant experience, particularly yeah. as mortgage rates are going up yeah. and you know, cost of living is going up. Absolutely. So are all of your team here in New Zealand or do you have some yeah, offshore no, as we well? Yeah, we are You're all completely. 100%. Kiwi, everything's done out of Auckland office. Yep. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, just thinking about if, if you could go back to your younger self, mm. is there any advice you would give yourself now? Uh, the big thing, yeah, the big thing for me uh, that I sort of touched on um, before we jumped on was, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily know exactly where you want to be or what, mm. what your career is going to look like. I always had a passion about getting involved in things and growing stuff. And I studied finance because it was the closest thing for me that felt like understanding the business world and how business operated. But it wasn't the perfect fit. It was just an area that sort of felt related and something I was interested in. Yeah. And in those early days of my career, particularly when I started in the NCDX, I started in the energy team. And the best thing I think I ever did, uh, and something I really encourage people today, is is being vocal about when I felt like I needed another opportunity. Yeah. When I needed a new challenge because. You know, it's very easy to sit there and then decide, actually, now I'm, I'm a bit over this and look I'm for bored. something else. Mm -hmm. I'm bored. But I, I said, I said, I don't know what I want to do. I, I feel like I'm kind of done with this era as in the energy team. It's like, I, I just want another challenge. Is there something else? And then that got me involved into the data team. And then that team was part of a business called Smart Shares and got me involved in the indexing and ETF space. And that all happened over sort of 18 months. And I worked a couple of those roles concurrently. And started to find what really excited me, what I was really passionate about and able to grow into those opportunities. And mm. my career progressed a lot quicker internally because of that and my commitment to taking on challenges and executing on them. And, you know, that ultimately has led to where I am today. And I encourage a lot of people out there to be proactive and vocal about when you want to take on a challenge or you need a new opportunity because I think you'll be surprised that the response you get from an employer and yep. good businesses will embrace you. Like good businesses will want to keep telling what to foster you and what yeah, you to grow. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I had really good managers. I had really good managers who supported that, who weren't just trying to keep you on the team because, you know, they're focused on their own, you know, KPIs. <laughs> yes. You know, when you've got good managers and good business leaders, they look beyond their immediate here and now and they will go, great. Yep. How do we make your career a success and how do we foster that and, and enjoyable think, yeah. exactly and, and, yeah. and that's a win for everybody i completely agree i did very much the same in my kind of early career as well but even in my later career i was working at the ice house and yeah. i actually started as, off as a startup business coach yep. and then i get quite easily bored it's like oh what else can i do and they're like well what else do you want to do i would love to do some market validation got yep. involved in market validation um, worked with snowball throughout their whole yeah. fma stuff as well and then it was like right i still want more to do well what about established businesses love to do it and you know i think as long as you they're aware that yeah. you are able to take on more, yeah. then they will look for ways to keep you interested and keep you going. Whereas yeah. um, they don't know if you're bored. They don't have, it's not, you're not being micromanaged. They don't know yeah. exactly what you're up to. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a big thing now for us internally. Mm. You know, how do we show and present opportunities for people to grow? And we're, we're really proactive. We're a small team. We don't have layers of hierarchy. Yeah. But when somebody is taking on new responsibilities, we champion that and we promote it internally so people know that, you know, there's a, there is a culture of taking on responsibility and building your own career and, and owning that. Hmm. You, you made a really interesting comment before you come to the podcast about, you know, obviously being an entrepreneur, it, it does take some balls, let's be honest. And, yep. it, and it comes with some stresses and some things yeah. that I mean, not, not everybody enjoys. Um, so is there a way to be involved in entrepreneurship without actually having to be the, the business yeah. owner? And we've had some, like, I've, I've had a couple of people in our team who have been involved basically since day dot. And they've talked about this and hearing it from their 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 lens where 
they didn't want to be in the traditional space. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be in a corporate or they'd been there and felt like they wanted another challenge. Um, but they knew that being the founder per se or taking on that pure responsibility wasn't for them. Yeah. You know, they liked the space but didn't want to, doing all of that <laughs> wasn't for them. <laughs> yep. And so there is that pathway for people that like you don't have to be the founder of a company to get involved with sort of an entrepreneurial space or to be effectively sort of an entrepreneur. You can get involved with these young and growing companies and make an impact and, you know, really shape where you want to go but without necessarily having everything tied up on the line and yeah. yeah. And so when you're looking to engage new people, when you're employing new people, what do you look for? Yeah, great one. We've historically, we, we try and avoid as much as possible just putting out a JD and filling for a JD. Good. That's just not <laughs> yeah. our approach. Um, we tend to put them out as a guidance and then kind of it gives a sense of where we need and as we've found great talent or somebody will come up through that, it's like, great, you would actually be a great fit, either your skill sets or your experience um, and your cultural fit to the business. It would be great to have you in here and we'll find a way for you to add value and we can add value for you. And then then we realize on the back of that, well, where the next gap is and as you start to look for slightly different skill sets or the next, in the next demands. And so we've kind of almost all organically growing through that process of just bringing on great people that have the skill sets and talents that um, fill some of the demands that we have and just backfilled from there over time. And and COVID has been great in that sense because we've had some people who've come back from overseas, for example, yeah. who were looking, who didn't want a traditional job and we were like, great, um, you know, you've got some amazing skill sets that traditionally wouldn't be accessible to us. We can make something work here. You know, it was on our roadmap to do something in this space at some point. Yep. We didn't know when or what it was going to look like, but you'd be a great fit to maybe help lead that. Why don't you come on board and let's just get going with it? And you can actually help prioritize and shape the business around the right people mm -hmm. um, rather than just putting JDs out and filling that box. Fair enough. So tell me from a, um, a company point of view, obviously a New Zealand-based company, everybody's yep. working in New Zealand, um, looking after Kiwi kind of consumers. Any plans to take it offshore? In the future, yeah. Look, Again, without giving away any secret sauce, no, but look, yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's definitely I, the problems we're talking about, which is how do people manage this as savings, investment, retirement? Mm. These are global problems. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, the relationship with banks, global problems. The housing accessibility, all of these issues are global. But the one of the big challenges with financial services is that why you don't see many big global financial services look very hard is the regulations, regulations with financial services country. are different in every single market. Yep. <laughs> and so it's it's a really challenging way to scale a business. You know, it's not just a, a, a general piece of technology you can roll out yeah. relatively light. But It's but, not like software as a service, which can pretty much go across yeah, anyway, any, anywhere. It's not like yep. yeah, building you know, some amazing gaming companies in New yeah. Zealand, right? Yeah. And you can build something and release it to a global audience overnight. Yep. Not quite as easy with financial services. But we've got pretty big ambitions for not only New Zealand, but longer term. And we'll look to do that well. Um, I think the interesting one here is, you know, where we see people making a lot of interesting business moves is a lot of Kiwis tend to want to jump to Australia yep. as the next step um, across all sectors. And I think people underestimate how different Australia is. And we've got a couple of Australians in our team and very good insight to they are quite culturally different. It's yep. a very different business environment. And... <laughs> Um, you know, I think it's interesting in thinking about, well, do you actually go to Australia? There are other markets that may be better for many Kiwi mm. businesses across many sectors, actually, because there's been a lot of companies who over the decades have tried to go to Australia and realise quickly that you can't just rinse and repeat what yeah. you've done in New Zealand. I always say, because I've actually I've been quite fortunate, I grew up in the UK, yeah. um, moved to Australia, lived there for 10 years, lived here for 20 odd years, and I've worked yeah. in the US as well. And I actually think Australia and the US are very, very similar yeah. in terms of the way they approach business and their attitude, everything. Yeah. And I think that New Zealand is far more British. In its yeah. sense. So, so maybe a Canada or a UK yeah, is actually exactly. a, a, a better option. I, I don't I, know. I, yeah. I very agree, because Australia is very competitive. Yeah. And it's very cutthroat. Yeah. And yes. and people I don't many Kiwi businesses, even very large businesses in New Zealand, we all just kind of don't rock the boat. Yep. <laughs> Stick to our little corner <laughs> and we're not too aggressive mm -hmm. and we'll all just happy days kind of get along type thing. 
but you know, Australia is more like the US. Like it people is. will, they're aggressive, businesses are aggressive, they're hungry. And that's quite a culturally different environment for many Kiwis to go into. Yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree. Yeah, interesting. Okay, um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to ask you, um, in terms of tips and tools, what would be the three kind of key things that you would share with anybody listening in? Yeah, look, the big thing for us, I think, what I found is, um, you know, as everyone talking about, that open communication has been that big piece for us, particularly yeah. over the past few years where, you're dealing with people who are wanting to remit, you've had periods of working remote and how you build a culture. So really clear, consistent communication across teams about the bigger vision and how that's executing. So little things that we do now, and that's sort of new to me, but something that the tech team brought to us is we do uh, every morning, Monday toast. So, oh, so yeah. Monday morning, uh, all hands in the office at 9am, round of coffee in the kitchen, and it's a chance for uh, groups of two within each team each week, some of these different, and it's a shout out to things that people have done well or successes, update on business metrics and update on what key things that each team are working on and yes. what's on the roadmap. And so it's a moment for all of us to keep connected, to come together all as a team again. And, you know, it's pretty common within tech space to do these sort of stand-ups. It's almost yeah. like a company-wide stand-up every Monday, but where we celebrate successes, talk about challenges, and that's been a great little cultural thing for us to um, keep us all aligned, get us all together. And it's great having everybody in the office and really clear about what's going on as a business. So nice. look at some of the cool things that many tech companies do, because often I suspect there'll be many people who are not involved in the tech space, but there are things that agile modern tech companies do culturally and business-wise that you can leverage into other businesses. Adopt, and yeah. I think it's a great way to shape your mindset particularly around efficiencies and how you're going to grow. and mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Number Thank one. You. What about number two, number three? <laughs> yeah. Um, what are the big things for us? Oh, again, the other, well, the biggest, uh, another recent one for us is being, you know, we're a small team yep. and we have the challenges that many small businesses have. So how do we scale? Mm. How do we build efficiency? And, and that also comes back to culture and, um, creating an environment where you encourage staff to present proactively ways of doing things smarter and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, again, as a technology business, we just held our second hackathon and that was a chance where we just had, there's no structure to it other than you get yourselves in team, you look at the problems that you may have, that your customers may have, that internally we have, and come up with a solution. It's a 24-hour window. So it's like a startup weekend, yep, but within your weekend, own business. business. So, yeah, yeah. And half a dozen teams got formed this time around, and they each had very clear understanding of a problem they wanted to solve. Either there was some internal processes they thought were inefficient between teams, or something was inefficient for a customer experience, and they had 24 hours to solve that problem, come up with a concept, and present it, and then they presented it as a team. Yeah, and I it's love a that. great way, exactly, that kind of startup mentality and keeping that startup mentality alive of, um, really always thinking about the problems, thinking about the customers and ensuring that everybody feels like they've got a voice yep. to proactively speak up to um, others above of, hey, we could do something smarter. Mm. And if you can do that within your business, you are going to be far more successful because you're going to be constantly solving and improving the outcomes for your customers. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to adapt and leverage new technology really well. And it's not just technology, though. I was just thinking about it. Like, yeah. it, it could just be a hackathon. It's just about any issues, Correct. challenges, problems Correct. that you're experiencing. Yep. And that, I'm assuming they're multifunctional teams that get together and yep. go, yep, we're exactly. going to work together and, You've got and to try and solve teams this. And yep. come up with the different teams structure that you need. And you put some rules around that. And yep. um, one of them actually was really simple. One of them that actually uh, was onboarding. So we've okay. grown. Yep. And as we've grown, obviously we, we've hired people and we will continue to hire people, but our onboarding experience, you know, as you grow a business, yeah. the process for onboarding somebody wasn't necessarily top of mind, yep. you know? And so we were giving inconsistent experiences with somebody joining Kernel. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's day one that you really want to give them that great impression about what they're joining and what do they need to know and how do you get sealed in. And so, um, you know, we literally established a new process over that 24 hours and roll that out, we, we spoke to some of the new starters in the team of what did you experience, what did you what not. worked, what didn't work, yep. <laughs> and um, established a whole new way. So now we've got a bit more structure around a part of the business that, look, it's a bit ad hoc, so it's not top of mind of like oh, onboarding somebody, you're not doing it every week. So mm -hmm. you don't always think about those things. But there was a great chance to think about those little things that will collectively yep. um, 
help shape our culture and the success of the business. So perfect, yeah. awesome. I guess finally, I mean, tell us a little bit about Kernel itself and yeah. and what um, how do people get involved? What what's yeah. the ideal customer for Kernel? So a lot of people, yeah. So our customer base is really really interesting. So we work. Our funds are being used by everyone from iwi and charity trusts mm. um, but people that are using our platform uh range from you know the most of our customers are 30s and 40 years old yep but we've got high net worth individuals with family offices using us which is astounding yeah but a lot of the people um we find are coming to us where they've got a bit of spare money or they've got some disposable income and they come to our platform they open an account and then they set up a couple of investment goals. It's like, right, I want to put some money aside for this is for the retirement. Yep. This is going to be for the kids. And then they set up most of them an automatic investment plan where they just want to set aside some money out of their paycheck really regularly. And it's giving them the confidence to know that they've got money being put aside that's going to be working for them for tomorrow. Yep. Same for the KiwiSaver. You can customize your KiwiSaver, have it aligned to your values. And effectively, we are a Kiwi company offering some of the lowest fees in the market um, with a really good digital experience. So we're not a bank. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people are coming to us from the bank where they realize actually there's a better way and um, I can get a better outcome from being involved with a company like Kernel. Yeah, and you feel like you've got more control yourself yeah. over what you're doing. Just in terms of investment, I mean, it is always a long-term thing, right? You, you can't yep. expect to get immediate returns from yep. investments. Um, so you're looking, but it depends on what you're looking for is how that investment um, yeah. strategy changes, right? So we do have a spectrum. So yep. we do have a savings account and mm. we've got a cash fund. So people are using the cash fund for those shorter-term goals, mm. an emergency fund or something, uh, saving up for a house deposit. Yep. Um, or they just want an income source. And so we've got the traditional, you know, cash and balance and high growth. Um, and then we've got other options that people can pick and choose from that are long-term focus. And, you know, for most people, uh, most of our customers are with us. And they're probably with us for a long time, yeah. you know, and we'll be that partner with them on that journey um, because they want to regularly invest. They've got time and they've, 10 plus years before they'll be in retirement. Yeah. And so th this is a space for them to build up some money. And some people, uh, the biggest interesting one in that category is people deciding, do I want to pay down the mortgage yep. or do I put some money aside? And we do find people as much as they want to pay down the mortgage, they like to have some, build up some assets that's not just their house. Yep. You know, just having something you know is a bit more accessible that you've got options with. Um, and KiwiSaver is the other big one. We can't underestimate, KiwiSaver is just about to take over $100 billion in New Zealand. Right. So it's $100 billion that we collectively now have that is setting up for our retirement. Mm-hmm. And people underestimate it. It will be the second biggest asset for most Kiwis out there in their lifetime. And taking that five minutes to go and understand, okay, who's your Kiwi saver with? Yep. And are you in the right type of fund? Mm -hmm. um, those two little changes can have literally hundreds of thousands of dollars impact in your retirement. Yep. <laughs> um, and there are some great sites out there that support that, like Sorted and others. And uh, next month, actually, is Money Month. So oh, wow. the annual... Um, sort of New Zealand a month where it's about promoting financial literacy and education. So mm -hmm. it's a great time to go and check what you're doing and have you got things set up for yourselves because it's something we don't think about. The other one on that is, I guess, given the focus on the business front, mm -hmm. many people who start their own businesses may not be contributing to KiwiSaver. Right, yep. Uh, and it's a great reminder, actually, still at least put in your $1,000 every year because you'll get that free $520 by the government. It just yep. got paid a couple of weeks ago for everybody. Mm -hmm. So even if you're self-employed, if you think about that that free return on that investment yeah. of putting $1,000 away over a few decades, you know that will still be a meaningful amount of money. So, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really valid point. Cool. Hey, look, thank you so much. I um, really enjoyed talking to you. If you want to get in contact with you, yeah. how, what's the best way to get in contact with you, Dan? Uh, Colonel.co.nz. Yep. And you can find me on LinkedIn as well. I'm always more than happy somebody reach out. It's just Dean Anderson on LinkedIn. You'll find me there and through the Colonel page and um, message me and reach out for a copy or a chat. So. That's yep. wonderful. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.